from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello, welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London, where I'm enjoying the early starts to get up and watch some of the action from the T20 World Cup down under in Australia. The weather's taking a bit of a turn for the worse, but kids are off school for half-term holiday next week, so a little bit more family time to come then, which is always uh, enjoyable uh, at this time of year. But yep, so much happening around the world of cricket, as always. Hi there, Jim Maxwell for the ABC from Sydney, I'm back from 10 days on a desert island. And uh, if you ever want to go to the Pacific and have a bit of fun on a very small and lovely island, uh, it's the most pristine place on the planet, I have to say. It's Lord Howe Island, by the way. But um, I'm back to reality. I'm back in Sydney and I'm getting ready for the next storm because it never stops raining in this place, just as well But most of the action in the cricket is taking a place elsewhere. And uh, we can only hope that when New Zealand play Australia on Saturday, we get some fine weather here in uh, stormy Sydney. I'm Charu Sharma for All India Radio, uh, back from back to Bangalore from wherever I was last week up north in India. And uh, I don't know, Australia and India have so much in common because Bangalore particularly, and now I can officially state this, I didn't want to talk about the weather, but what else? Because we have now had the highest ever rainfall in the last 75 years of authenticated records. So... Oh boy, it's just, uh, I, I lived uh, or I live on a street called Richmond Road, which has now officially been renamed Richmond River. So now we have a wonderful river view because of the excess rain. But of course, cricket wise, all eyes on the T20 World Cup and uh, we'll see who wins it. Mm, talking of rivers, I mean, large parts of Australia, Victoria in particular, have been underwater, haven't they, Jim? But if you talk about storms, well, I'm not even going to go down the political route of what's happening in the UK at the moment, but there's been a storm of another kind whipping up around cricket and uh, during the T20 World Cup as well. And that's where we'll start with Stumped this week, because we're going to ask the question, should cricket be concerned about where its money comes from? Now, this week, the International Cricket Council announced a World Cup partnership with a large oil company, Aramco, who are owned by the government of Saudi Arabia, raising issues of both sustainability and an association with a country that has a poor human rights record. Now, Stumps has spoken to a number of high-profile current international players who are unhappy about the partnership, one saying it makes them feel, quote, very uncomfortable, another saying it should be flagged to the Players' Union and a current administrator admitting it is far from ideal. Now, I've been speaking to the BBC sports editor, Dan Rowan, and asked him to tell us a little bit more about the, the partnership. Hi, Ali. Well, according to the ICC, they are, and I quote from their statement when they announced this deal, one of the world's leading integrated energy and chemicals companies. What their press release announcing this deal failed to mention, however, was the fact that the company is also from Saudi Arabia. In fact, they're owned by the Saudi state. The Saudi government uh, owns 94% of the company, in fact, which is also the world's biggest oil exporter. It's one of the world's most valuable companies. It's been helped, of course, when it comes to revenues by the rising price of oil in recent months. It's no stranger to sports sponsorship either. Aramco is already a sponsor of the IPL, um, F1, and it's one of the biggest backers uh, of women's golf uh, as well. And it's the latest example, of course, of Saudi investment in sports that the country's sovereign wealth fund, the PIF, owns English Premier League football club Newcastle United. And it's also the organisation that's bankrolling the Live Golf Series, which, of course, is, is a controversial rival circuit that's currently taking on the more established PGA and, and European tours in golf. So why is this particular partnership now causing a stir? Well, according to environmentalists, Aramco has generated more than 4% of all global greenhouse gases since 1965, and it's the world's largest corporate greenhouse gas emitter. Now, Aramco has stated an ambition to reach operational net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, and they insist that they're making progress. They're doing their bit. They're trying. But some believe that associating with such a company jars somewhat when you consider the fact that, that cricket is very popular, of course, as you know, in countries like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Australia, all, all places that are very vulnerable, as we've seen, to intense weather conditions, sea level rises that have been linked to emissions of greenhouse gases, and, and that, that there are concerns over the game's sustainability in the future, given the nature of cricket. So 
I think firstly, there's this suspicion of what's known as greenwashing, using such a commercial arrangement to try and clean the reputation of an environmental record. And on top of that, human rights groups say that, that sports like cricket are being used by Saudi Arabia and indeed other countries to try and improve their image by what's called sports washing. It's human rights record. Now, there are heavy restrictions uh, in Saudi Arabia on freedom of expression, women's rights, the treatment of the LGBT community. All these concerns have been raised, as has the use of the death penalty uh, for offences that are not recognised as crimes under international law. Now, some of the more high-profile cases in the country to have drawn criticism this year include, for example, the execution of 81 people in a single day, uh, the Leeds University student Salma al Shehab being jailed for 34 years for tweets which were considered critical of the state. Now, the Saudi government has, has previously denied accusations that it's using sport in such a way to try and improve its image overseas, insisting instead that this investment is part of a, a much bigger attempt to help the country to modernise, to boost tourism and to diversify their economy. But when you consider that you know the recent ICC partnership with UNICEF, for example, to promote gender equality or, or Australian players' support for the Cricket for Climate campaign, you can see why some believe there is perhaps a contradiction, a tension. Other, others, however, see this as an opportunity instead and point out this is hardly the first such company to engage in a partnership of this kind. And I think when you know what you have to say, Ali, when it when it comes to sponsors, there are issues in other sectors, of course, whether it's fast food companies, alcohol companies, gambling, cryptocurrency, airlines, or oil and energy. There's issues with, with all of these sectors when it comes to sports sponsorship. So this is not a simple debate. It's, it's, it's a very complicated one and a very interesting one as well. So what exactly will this particular partnership look like on the ground? Well, it's already underway, actually, because it, it, it's already been activated at the current T20 Men's World Cup in Australia because the, Aramco have got naming rights for the Player of the Match Awards. The sponsorship covers all of the ICC's major men's and women's events, in fact, until the end of 2023. So that includes the Women's T20 World Cup in South Africa, the World Test Championship final in the UK, and the ICC Men's World Cup, of course, in India next year as well. And you mentioned some of the criticisms and perceived criticisms around it have the what have the ICC had to say uh, in light of some of those criticisms well in its statement announcing the deal the ICC said that Aramco sponsorship reflected a shared focus on sustainability and innovation as it moved forwards it said towards making cricket a more sustainable sport it added that recycling machines would be installed across all seven match venues in Australia at the T20 World Cup enabling plastic waste to be converted into clothing now I understand that the ICC does intend to create a sustainability fund where players can nominate organizations uh, that can get some money uh, using some of the millions of dollars that this deal will generate I understand it's more than 10 million dollars but there was no detail on this in the original statement announcing this arrangement. And as I say, nor was there any mention of the Saudi connection, meaning that some players and administrators perhaps are only now learning of, of this association. Aramco said excellence was one of its core values and that this ref was reflected in their support of cricket at the elite level. But clearly, they're also thinking about the, the, the huge popularity of the sport um, and, and see this strategically as well. Now, Greenpeace, the environmental campaign group, said in a statement that it was laughably absurd that the future of cricket is threatened by the same climate crisis that Aramco is fueling. And it said that organisations like the ICC should really ask themselves whether a betting this kind of blatant greenwash, as they put it, is worth the oil money that they are getting. Both Aramco and the ICC declined to respond to that criticism, Ali, when we approached them. Amnesty, human rights organisation, said it would encourage cricketers to educate themselves about the issues and the situation in Saudi Arabia. But as I said earlier, when it comes to these allegations of sports washing, the Saudi government has always denied that. I mean, I, I myself spoke to the Saudi sports minister in 2019 when I was in Riyadh covering the second fight between Anthony Joshua and Andy Ruiz, big boxing fight, and asked the government minister on that occasion whether this was all just part of sports washing. And he said, no, absolutely not. This is about trying to boost tourism, diversify our economy and get our population more active by inspiring them through sport. 
Dan, interesting on the climate front, Australia's test and now new one day captain, Pat Cummins is very vocal, like a very vocal climate advocate. And you mentioned yeah. uh, earlier the Cricket for Climate movement, which he's helped to set up. Um, he was asked this week about Cricket Australia ending a partnership with Alinta Energy, a, a, another energy company. Just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, this, Ali. In, in a statement, Cricket Australia have, have denied a report that Cummins influenced a decision to end that sponsorship deal with the power company. The governing body said that Alinta was stopping the partnership, in fact, due to what it called a change in its brand strategy. Now, Cummins, who, as you say, has, has regularly made a stand when it comes to green issues and climate change, had reportedly voiced his concerns to, to Cricket Australia's chief executive, but the governing body said that at no point did any conversation between the pair have a bearing on Alinta's decision to go its separate ways. It said it was grateful for the company's generous sponsorship, noting that its leadership on transition to net zero uh, and the development of offshore wind farms was, was significant and deserved praise. But Alinta has been described, Ali, as Australia's seventh biggest climate polluter in this year's Greenpeace Green Electricity Guide. Now, Cummins has also denied that he was the reason behind the partnership ending next year, but he did confirm at a press conference that he would not feature in any promotional material for the company during the final year of its sponsorship deal. Every organisation has a responsibility to do what's right for the sport and what they think is right for the organisation, and I hope society, when it moves forward, Cummins said, it is a balance when you make decisions about who you're going to welcome into the cricket family. Now, interestingly, he also distanced himself when asked from the ICC sponsorship with Aramco, explaining that players were at arm's length from the IC's decision-making. Now, we asked the Federation of International Cricket Cricketers Associations, or FICA, what they made of all this, and they told us that part of a proposal on the relationship between themselves and the ICC is a framework for dialogue on how cricket approaches human rights responsibilities. But in the meantime, it's said that if players did not want to be associated with a particular sponsor, then they would support those players. So it's going to be really interesting, I think, to see as word spreads, how some players across the world uh, react to, to this news around Aramco. Dan Rowan, thank you very much for being with us on Stumps. That was Dan Rowan, sports editor for the BBC. Um, lots to unpack there. So just, to, just to recap what Pat Cummins said in an interview, he said, I hope that the purpose of sport is to hopefully be a good thing for society and who we partner with, what decisions we make, he says, I hope are in the best interests of not only sport, but our society. Interestingly, he's since been subject to accusations of hypocrisy. Uh, for speaking out against climate change when he's a cricketer who flies around the world. But it's fair to point out that Cummins' Cricket for Climate organisation he set up was specifically born out of a desire to offset his carbon footprint. Now, finally on Stumped, India and Pakistan appear to be at a standoff. It's being reported that the Pakistan Cricket Board are threatening to pull out of next year's ODI World Cup in India. That's because Jay Shah, the secretary of the Indian Cricket Board, the BCCI, says India won't travel to Pakistan for next year's Asia Cup. As it stands, Pakistan are due to host the tournament for the first time since 2008. Shah now wants it to be moved to a neutral venue. Charu, what have you made of all this? What more can you tell us? Well, if this episode has not been controversial enough, OK, here we go. Uh, I, I really do think that uh, wearing different hats uh, should mean uh, being more careful. And if you're the ACC chief, you need to see it in light of the Asian Cricket Council and not so much your home board. Which so, Jay Shah is, isn't it? We haven't made that clear. He is both the president yes, of the Asian Cricket correct. Council and yeah, secretary of BCCI. Yeah, well, you know, I, I do feel terrible for Ramiz Raja, my good friend, and, and, and Pakistan cricket, because now they've got cricket going on in Pakistan, thanks to many other countries. And it seems to be safe enough. Most of the matches have gone without any incident at all, it's all of them. Uh, and this instant call for not playing in Pakistan as a continuation of the, India, uh, of the Indian policy for so many years uh, should perhaps have been held back just a bit. Uh, and, and Pakistan, of course, are always very keen and happy to come to India and play as they did uh, the World Cup some time back. But I think Ramiz is within his rights to say that if there's no visit to Pakistan, then perhaps we won't visit India when it comes to the World Cup next year. Uh, it's a very good time for the ICC to step in and take control of the situation and, and, and well, counsel the countries on the way forward. Really, it's time to resolve uh, the, this, this long-standing situation between India and Pakistan. Of course, I can't speak for all the people, but I would like to 
suggest that the sporting population of India is only too happy to have these contests continue in either nation. And certainly the sporting population of Pakistan is very happy to, to play uh, cricket in India. Uh, I will also add that if the reason for not playing cricket in Pakistan by India was because of all the cross-border terrorism and all the rest of the very unsavory situations, for the last 10, 12 years that India has not played in Pakistan, have those situations lessened? My unschooled opinion is that they haven't. So what has been achieved here? Oh, I just wish they'd just get on with playing the game. As he keeps saying in uh, this show and many others, the fans don't give a damn about the politics. They just want to see the cricket played, um, whether it's in Pakistan or India. So I would like to hope that uh, this, again, uh, could be an opportunity uh, for the politicians to sit at the same table, perhaps, at a cricket match. Uh, it's always been a great place for people to get together. As Dwight Eisenhower, if he was still around, would tell us from way back in the 1950s when he visited Pakistan. But, uh, yeah, come on, folks, get on with it. Roger Michael Humphrey Binney, maybe he's a man who can have some influence on this. <laughs> well, I'm really happy for him. He's a very close friend, and I'm so glad that he's helping the, uh, the BCCI for a while. Although, of course, it's a large team, and I wonder how much a president can influence everything that happens uh, in a cricket board, but it's nice to have a, a, the calming influence of Benny. But tell you what, the other big news from the BCCI, and this will be something that the new president, Roger Benny, will be overseeing, is the formal, uh, going, the formal creation of the Women's IPL, which we have talked about so much uh, on Stumps over the years, given the, the, the official green light at the BCC's board meeting. Um, no official word yet, Chara, I believe I'm right in saying, about what it, the format will exactly be, but reports are that uh, we're expecting a five-team tournament, maybe across uh, two venues for matches. One thing I think is for sure is that a five-team tournament will expand rapidly because I believe the, the market is there, the TV rights are there, uh, India is ready for a women's IPL, there is appetite for it and there are eight teams in the hundred uh, already, we've got the, B, the WBBL, the CPL, the PSL, uh, South Africa, where are you with your women's T20 tournament now? That would be the final question but yeah, big news in that the women's IPL will definitely happen. Well that is it for this week's Stumped. So my thanks to Jim Maxwell and Chari Sharma and, of course, to all of you. We'll see you again next week. Till then, bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.